<laughs> okay, so the question says, some, um, so I, I like to doodle when I, uh, as I read the questions to make sure I understand all the information that's given. So let me doodle as I go. It says um, mass of a firework shell is fired straight up. Oh, straight up. That seems easy. Okay, straight up from a mortar. So this is a launcher thingy. And this is a shell. It's fired straight up. And reaches a height of 115 meters. Okay, I'm going to draw a very schematic, not to scale drawing. So the mortar reaches a height here. And then we are going to call that 115 meters. That's our height H. Okay. Um, neglecting air resistance. We try to ignore friction and air resistance whenever we can. And sometimes not even when we can't, because uh, especially air resistance, it makes problems super complicated numerically. So we will almost never quantitatively handle air resistance. So neglecting air resistance, calculate the shell's velocity when it leaves the mortar. Oh, so this is a kinematics question. And there are different ways to answer that. I believe uh, most people would probably answer this by uh, going through your kinematics formulas and remembering V final squared is equal to V initial squared uh, plus uh, 2A delta X. And here, this is your delta X. Your A is equal to a minus G and uh, your V final for the height position of the height here. That's a zero. I, I think uh, um, if I had to take a guess, more than half the people would do that. So let me do it the other way, which is the longer way. So um, if you did it this way, that's perfectly fine. Um, in fact, you know, if I'm under time constraint, that's how, how I would do it too. But let me show the longer way, uh, just to show that um, doing, uh, just to show that solving problems well in physics doesn't necessarily involve memorizing lots of formulas. Um, so when I try to solve physics problems, what I like to do is visualize the physical setup. So I have this projectile that's going to be being uh, launched up with some speed of uh, V0, and I visualize its uh, trajectory. I see that it's okay to go moving up, reaching some height, H. And then after having reached that height, it's gonna be falling back down. And then when it's down about to hit the ground, um, assuming it doesn't explode me there, then uh, I guess uh, from my intuition tells me that these two velocities will be the same. Okay. Um, so I, that's the mental image I have. And from the mental image I have, I think I said, okay, I'll calculate the shell's velocity when it leaves the mortar. So the, the intuition I have is that there is some connection between this velocity here and this height here. The faster the, uh, the, the, faster the shell is, um, uh, leaving the mortar, the higher height it's going to reach. So, so I think through, okay, uh, what expressions did I learn that relate them? I have expression that involves the height of a projectile with the, um, its uh, initial conditions, initial position plus V naught Y times time oh yeah this is a function of time and then for projectile motion where you have acceleration due to gravity the last term here would be minus one half g t squared okay um oh and i guess uh, in order to make use of this given information about the height we would say um so at some time time final, or I guess uh, final is a bit of a misnomer here because that's not the final final. So time at the top, time when it reaches the top, its y position is going to be h. Okay, um, 
after having written this expression, um, there's something I like to do every time I, um, every time I, uh, before I spend a lot of time trying to do the math part of the problem solving, I like to do this. I want to uh, count my knowns, or sorry, no. I want to account for my pieces of information, and I want to count everything that's not known, and I want to make sure those two things match. So what that means in concrete terms is I count my number of equations. I have one equation. And algebraically, that means I can only solve up to one unknown using that one equation. So I look through here. My initial position, oh, I know that. That's a zero. It starts from ground. My initial velocity, OK, I don't know that. I'm being asked about it. And time at the top, I wasn't given that, so I don't know that either. Minus one half gt. OK, so here I have one equation, two unknowns. So before I do a lot of math, I already know I don't have enough information. I need to find more information before I can start. And this is where you have to um, spend a little more time thinking through what information was given in the uh, question. And this is one of those things that really comes only with, um, only with the practice, because some pieces of information are not directly spelled out, but we expect that you will be able to figure it out. And here, the thing that you, uh, we hope you will eventually figure out is um, when we talk about some height, maximum height something reaches, uh, we are not giving you just one piece of information, this. We are giving you two pieces of information. We are telling you that at, uh, this is the height that they reach at particular time, and two, when the thing is at this height, we know its velocity. Its velocity is zero. That's the only way that can be the maximum height. If it had a positive velocity, then it's moving higher up. If it had a negative velocity, then it's coming down from something else. So there's this second piece of information that we haven't used. That not only we know the change of height, we know, or we can relate to change of velocity. So once you realize that, then you think through some of the kinematics formulas that you've learned, and hopefully you eventually arrive at this, which is velocity as a function of time is my initial velocity. And for this uh, projectile motion, it's going to be minus gt. So uh, for the time at the top, my velocity at the top will be 0. And, uh, and this is my second equation. And looking at this second equation, I ask myself, do I have any new unknowns? Oh, well, these two are the same, so it's three nine. So these, they are the same unknown, and this time at the top, it's also the same unknown. So we now finally have two equations for the two unknowns we are trying to solve. For. So, so once I determine that, then now I'm ready to do the bunch of math that I need to do. I need to solve the second equation for the time at, for one of the unknowns. And um, I recommend that you do this, um, approach this systematically and deliberately. And really the thing to remember is that the, uh, when you have system of equations, uh, the quantity that you want, you want to be solving for it last because um, in anything but the very last step, you are eliminating the quantity. So watch, I'm going to solve equation two for time at the top. So when I do that, I have time at the top is equal to three naught y over g. And the thing about this expression, time at the top is given in terms of this unknown. So I actually don't know the time it takes to the, get to the top of that uh, trajectory. Uh, what this is useful for is I can use this expression to eliminate time from the rest of my equations. So that's what I'm going to be, oh, sorry, that question mark is confusing me with the power of two. <laughs> so here, what I'm going to be using this expression for is to eliminate time from my expressions, which means in the very next step, I'm not solving for time. So, so, but let me do that. So I'm going to be eliminating time from my equations using this. And once I've done that, I get uh, 
3 naught y times this expression, uh, 3 naught y over g minus 1 half g t, uh, not t, it's plug in time, um, 1 half g time at the top, uh, 3 naught y over g squared is equal to h. You don't forget anything. Okay, uh, I can simplify this a bit. Uh, let me observe uh, or let me distribute the square here, here. Then I see I can cancel out some of this. Oh, and I if I have v not y squared, then this is actually same looking as this, except with a factor of one half. So um, taking the difference, it's gonna be one half v not y squared over g is equal to h. Now I can solve for v not y squared, or I can solve for this quantity here. And when I do that, that's the answer. Uh, let me do that in my head and let me do that in my head and plug that expression in here. So that's gonna be square root of two g h, where g is nine point eight meter per second squared as usual, and h is what's given here. So that's it, and that's the same answer you would have got. You would get if you remember v squared the formula. Um, here I'm just taking the long route to, to illustrate that you don't have to remember, you don't have to memorize a bunch of formulas. You just have to uh, remember some of the basic ones that that connect to really the basic definitions of the position and velocity um, under constant acceleration. So, okay. Uh, it says the second part says the motor itself is a cube. 0 0.450 meter long. Calculate the average acceleration of the shell in the tube as it goes from zero to the velocity found in a O. Oh. <laughs> you know what, let me use the V squared formula here. So here, actually, you can do the exact same thing I did here, and except uh, you don't use G, you leave that as A, and then you solve for acceleration. You can do that. I leave that up for you. But I'm watching my time and I need to finish this question so that I can do the other questions. So <laughs> let me just uh, use the V squared formula, which says V final squared is equal to V initial squared uh, plus two times acceleration times. And let me call this L and that's the L here. And uh, there's one thing to be careful about whenever you are using V squared formula, it's about this sign here. Um, if uh, you are keeping this as plus a sign, you want to make sure your acceleration and the displacement are in the same direction. And in the case of B, that is the case because the, it's being accelerated. Um, so it's speeding up. So, yeah. So you're in this particular case, your initial velocity was zero because that's where it was starting from. And your final velocity is this V that we found above. So uh, solving for acceleration here, and it's gonna do that in my head. I'm just dividing by 12, that's basically. So acceleration will be uh, V squared, V coming from above, V squared, divided by uh, 2L. And plug in the numbers, that should be your acceleration. And, Oh, C is a potentially tricky one. It's asking, what is the average force on the shell in the mortar? That's measured in units of its own weight. Um, okay, it's a tricky in two ways. Um, so you should start from what you know, which is that uh, Newton's second law, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. You have the acceleration there or you have the average acceleration, which means from that you might say my average of my average force uh, on the mortar shell is mass times that acceleration above. Okay. Now the first tricky thing is um, it's not asking for force in newtons. So um, it's <laughs> asking in units of its own weight. So you need to figure, all right, its own weight is gonna be uh, mg. So if you are trying to express this in the unit of this, 
the numerical value is basically the net force that you calculated, mass times acceleration, divided by the weight, mg. Uh, so m is going to cancel out. So, um, so this will give you some unitless number that uh, what they are probably asking for. Now, I would worry about one more thing, which is um, when they say average force, do they mean average net force? <laughs> if they do, then, then this is done. Uh, we are done here. If they didn't mean average net force, but they meant like average applied force, average force that the mortar applies on the shell, then, um, then you have to go through one more step, which is that the net force that you are considering is the applied force minus the weight. Um, if you draw the free body diagram for the mortar shell while it's being fired, then you can figure it out. Weight is pulling it down. There is some external applied force that's pushing it up. So, um, so if this is the scenario, then you'd have to basically from what you calculated, you'd have to add one unit of weight back in to get this force. But I, I don't think that's what the question is asking. I would only worry about this if after plugging in this, the system says my answer is wrong. Then I say, okay, um, they must have not be asking about the net force and uh, go back to this and make the correction. So <laughs> try it out and <laughs> see what the system gives you.